All right, so it's Todd Atkins, and uh, I'm here with Ian Lind of ilind.net, I-L-I-N-D.net. That's where you can find uh, his blog and a lot of the stories that he's been doing on Mike Miska. I think as far as coverage goes, there's no one who's been doing better coverage than him or anything near as extensive as him. And uh, last time we did a show, a lot of people watched it. There's been a lot of people that have shared some of the recordings and, and whatnot. And uh, Ian, I really want to thank you for the time to do this and everything. And, uh, you know, I just kind of wanted to let you start out and maybe give your opening thoughts from the last time we talked and maybe what first come to your mind since then. Well, let me just start with a sort of a progress report on the trial so far. The trial started um, January 6th, but from then to January 22nd, it took, it took to select a jury to have several evidentiary hearings where there were arguments before trial about what should be allowed and what shouldn't be allowed. So opening statements weren't until January 22nd. As of March 7th, all of, so end of January, all of February, and as of March 7th, uh, there had been nearly 70 prosecution witnesses presented and prosecution estimated that they were only 20 to 25 percent completed with their case. Uh, since then, there's been another 40 witnesses, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm guessing that means they're 40 percent finished, uh, somewhere between 40 and 50 percent finished. So far, the prosecution has been very methodical. You can tell they're checking off boxes. Mr. So-and-so, did you do this? Yes. Why did you do that? Um, where did you go afterwards? Who did you talk to? You know, they're they're checking off boxes they need to have things in evidence. Um, is, is this your phone in this picture? Yes. Is this their contact list? Yes. Who are these people on your contact list? And they go through and everybody explains who the people are. And pretty soon you notice they're all the same. Hmm. Um, or there's a the hell of a lot of overlap. Yeah. It's like the, but they they aren't going in a in a just a straight line order it's as if they have a big puzzle on the table and they're putting a piece here and a piece here and a piece here and every once in a while there're two pieces next to each other and you say aha they fit together but the whole picture isn't visible yet right it's all these discrete elements discrete incidents um and and they don't have the luxury apparently of explaining to you why we're doing this to put these pieces together you're going to find out as the trial goes along and as they wrap it up um towards the end with their own closing statements okay so that that's kind of what's going on from there and from the defense point of view of course this is a tough case for the defense um, government has millions of pages of documents and you know terabytes of uh, photos and recordings their, their approach has been to try and undermine even in just the littlest bit, the credibility of each witness. So um, they do that by pointing out differences between what you said here and what you said here. So for example, someone gets beaten up to a pulp, they, they, an ambulance comes, the ambulance uh, driver or the attendant makes a report saying that the guy didn't say what happened to him, he said he ran into a wall, okay. So then he comes, it comes out later that he was beaten up by three thugs coming from Misty. And the defense will say, well, but you didn't say that right after the incident, did you? I got witnesses can, you know, repeatedly say, well, no, I was afraid for my life. I was afraid for my family. I didn't say it then. I told them, but I didn't tell authorities. And that gets repeated every time. Every witness, they try and find something that they didn't say and they said it again later as if that made it untrue. So they're hoping that by repeatedly doing that, they can undermine many or most of the witnesses. Whether that's successful remains to be seen. Um, and what about all those who have flipped? Now, remember, there's each of Miski's uh, 12 co-defendants flipped on him by the time of trial. And there's another eight or 10 who were charged separately who also flipped. And so in dealing with them, 
the defense has, has tried to say, so Mr. So-and-so, um, your plea deal, before your plea deal, you were charged with many offenses, weren't you? Yes. Well, one of those was a drug offense. Yes. What was the minimum sentence for the drug offense? Oh, it was a 10-year minimum. In your plea deal, does it include the 10-year minimum? No, it doesn't. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so you, you think you can say anything you want here and uh and get that you know save yourself from all that time in prison you don't want to spend any extra time in prison do you oh no sir no one wants to spend time in prison <clears throat> the government comes back immediately after that and says well mr so-and-so what are the requirements of your plea agreement isn't there one requirement yes what's the requirement that i tell the truth and what hap and what happens if you don't tell the truth all those other charges can come back and including when the maximum sentences for all those other charges. So you have the two sides at loggerheads um, on what it means to have flipped and, and whether you whether it's likely that makes you um, more prone to lying. OK, so one other thing I wanted to say, just setting the stage. You know, I wrote more about this case than anyone in the three years leading up to the trial, three and a half years. But a trial that's going to go on for six to eight months, um, five days a week, I just said, hey, I'm supposed to be retired. You know? um, I'm doing this as my retirement um, you know, activity, but I can't, I can't do that. And it turns out no one, no news organization in Hawaii has the resources to put someone there at the trial every day, week after week, month after month to see this through. So many days um, in the courtroom, they have a, a, a row set aside reserved for media. Many days it's empty. Um, since I, I can't worry about the budget of the big news organizations, I recruited volunteers. And so now I have a volunteer, at least hopefully every day, who observes the trial and takes notes and submit, submits those notes as soon as they can to me. So we have a running record of basically what's going on in the trial and also uh, have access to the exhibits from the that are admitted into the trial so that um, piecing those two together, I can get a pretty good idea of what's gone on. I try and go enough so that I keep up on, on the way things are moving. One thing you've got to say, they've been going up to January, February, March, April. They've been going for three months. And three months into a trial like this, you can tell the attorneys are exhausted, um, especially the, the defense attorneys. Neither of these come, have a big firm behind them. Um, they have a couple of associates, it looks like, who stand by. But by and large, it's um, two attorneys, one from out of Reno, Nevada, and one who's here locally. And you can tell they're wiped out because when the trial's over that night, they have to sit down, they have to figure out if they're new exhibits uh, they, they want to introduce based on what was said in trial that day. And um, then they have to get those written up and submitted. That happens every other day or every two or three days. It's, it's obviously just exhausting. The jury is also exhausted because so far, it's been like a machine gun of re incidents, attacks, assaults. Here's this event. Here's this event. Some with the same people, some with other people. I'll just give you a few ideas. On the question of assaults, they put, they've so far put up a number of people to show that Miski had a pattern of responding to competition in his businesses with violence. So a simple one, um, 2011, he found out that he was told by one of his uh, employees of Kama and a termite that there was this termite guy for another company, a salesman, and he had a book and he would show prospective customers and say, hey, look, look at what Kama Aina did. They didn't put the right gas in here and these guys' termites didn't get killed. You shouldn't go to Kama Aina termite. You know, look at look at my evidence here. Well, the next sometime a few days later, 
that salesman at the other company got a call and said, hey, I'd like to look at my house. You know, I've had come on a termite, but I know I don't think they're doing a good job. Can you come look at my house? So he drove over thinking he's you know, going to land some new business. And instead, he ran into a couple of thugs um, sent by apparently sent by Miski, who beat the crap out of him and uh, left him, you know, left him there. And the next day he got a telephone call. He said he recognized Miski's voice saying, don't ever fuck with Kama Aina. You know, OK, that, that was a simple one. Um, there were some more. Uh, um, well, more serious ones. For example, um, he, he once beat up one of his own employees. This guy was a bartender at his nightclub, the M nightclub. And prior to the M, he had worked at the club in that same space, um, Ocean, Zeta Wade. And Miski came, Miski came up to him early one evening and said, hey, uh, you know, we're, we're thinking of buying some equipment um, for these point, the point of sale computer system from uh, a company that's going out of business. And could you check it out? Because he'd previously had a side job installing these point of, uh, point of sale systems. So he said, oh, sure, boss, you're the boss, um, but I should tell my, my manager. No, 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 don't worry, you're with me, just come along. So they walked outside and there was a big black SUV waiting. And as the bartender testified, he said these, uh, I found myself in the back seat between two refrigerator sized men. And he said, and he said, and they didn't look like technicians. So they drove him from uh, the nightclub, which is down by Alamoana Center, drove him through town, went out to Sand Island and went by all the businesses in Sand Island that were out in the dark where there were no street lights. And Miski kept saying the next place, next, not here, next one. And they finally came to a little dirt road down to the water. And uh, they got out into the headlights of the SUV. And uh, two of these guys pounded on him until he couldn't stand. He was down. They were all kicking him. And then they, uh, Miski accused him of uh, stealing from the till at his bar. And he had insisted he didn't do anything like that. But Miski said, you owe me $10,000. He said, I don't have $10,000. I can't, I can't, I don't know. Anyway, they beat the, the heck out of him. Um, and then they, then they left him there telling him, look, we know where you live. We know where your girlfriend lives. Don't go to the police. We'll know because we have people in the police. Um, don't keep your mouth shut. Don't say anything. And they left him there. So apparently he staggered up. He had one shoe. He couldn't find the other one. His clothes are torn. He walks to the <clears throat> the um, La Mariana restaurant, which is a, a ways away. He got there and it was closed, but he knocked on the door and they answered and they let him use a phone. He called his girlfriend, told her not to tell the police. She came and picked him up. Um, he was all beat up. Eventually, I mean, he went through a series of of uh, medical things, but eventually he lost one eye because of the blunt force trauma in that beating. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Only once that they testified so far did um, did Miski's strong arm approach meet its match, and this was with the head of, a, of another company, uh, Sandwich Island um, Pest Control, Michael Botha. He'd come from South Africa as a young man, studied entomology in the US, got a job with um, Termidex. <clears throat> and, that, and in 2003, he'd started his own company, Sandwich Isle. He was in Costco and this guy walked up to him and it's Mike Miski. And Mike Miski starts after him about I hear you're, you're saying bad things about Kamaina. You, know, you don't know who I am. You don't know how we do things here. Apparently, both have told him, well, you know, what do you want to do? And my sister says, let's go outside and settle this. Okay, so both walked outside. <clears throat> they both started, you know, facing off. And uh, the police were called. The police came and Miski threatened them, you know, hey, your tents are going to start 
start getting ripped. You you watch, you know, you don't know who I am. So they split, the you know, police broke them up, everybody went on their way. And that night someone went and um slashed one of the tents at a at a house that was being tented by um both this company. That went on for several months. And at first he wasn't worried, but as you know, the the damage continued, he was he was very worried. He's he testified that I believe it's fifty to seventy thousand dollars worth of damage to his tents. So finally, he started asking people in, that he knew in the industry, locally and nationally, "What should I do? You know, how, how should I how should I deal with this guy?" And finally, he talked to a friend who's a police officer here, who said, "Well, <clears throat> best thing you can do, call him up, deal with it directly." So he did. He called up Miski. Miski agreed to meet him. But uh, Botha was worried about it. He didn't think he didn't think he could trust Miski, so um, he said, "Oh, let's meet. We'll meet at Starbucks." But he had a plan that when he got to Starbucks, they'd say, "Oh, I'm hungry. Let's go to another restaurant nearby." So that's what he did. They met at Starbucks. They moved to another restaurant. But he also had a handgun on his waist and his I don't know if it was a rifle or a shotgun in his truck. So they went inside, they had this conversation, this has to stop, he told Miski. And then, according to his testimony, he said, and Mr. Miski, if anything happens to someone in my family, anyone happens to my friend or my or anything further happens to my company, I will kill you. And he left. Now, he had been in combat as a member of the uh, South African Army previously as a younger man. And I guess uh, he sounded like he meant he meant this threat because he testified the problem stopped, his his tents um, stopped being slashed, and it went on. One break, just a. Uh, there were, okay, starting again. <clears throat> there were several other. Similar assaults described. Um, a few involved used car dealers. Now, Miski, through one of his companies, had both a, a company license to as a used car dealer and his own personal license as a used car salesman. And he and several others in his inner circle, who also had licenses, would attend a, a wholesale dealer auction. The auction went, I think, every two weeks. And um, he got a reputation for threatening other bidders so that people were afraid to bid against him to pick up cars. And so he would be able to buy these. Um, he usually bought junker cars, low prices, gave them out to, to people in his crew. They could resell them as used cars and then keep the money. It was a way of giving them support. So... Um, One dealer one day didn't realize he was bidding against Miski and bought and bought a car. And Miski came over and said, "Look, I, I want that car. I want. I really want that car. I'll pay you. I think it was five hundred dollars over what you paid. I'll give you a five hundred dollar commission. You let me buy the car." This guy, this guy said, "Okay, I'll take your five hundred dollars." They went over and arranged that he would Miski would buy it instead of him. He took the five hundred dollars. He went home, and Miski called him a couple of days later. Said that car's junk, doesn't run. He said, Well, it was, it was a, an auction of, of cars that didn't run. What are you complaining about? No, 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 you know, you got to give me my money back. The guy agreed to meet Misty. And uh, so he did. They, he, they met at, a, I think it was a Wendy's, someplace out by the airport. And again, Misky's, Misky was standing there. The guy got out of his car and immediately two big guys came towards him and, and they beat him up and he broke, it broke his tooth. And he spent all he said, after they left, he had to crawl around on the ground and find his tooth, hoping they, and they tried to implant it again and it didn't work. But um, uh, there were two, I think two other used car um, dealers who also testified one with a similar situation, another, just having observed, uh, having Miski threaten him 
but he he himself wasn't beaten up. But at least he he testified about the threats and about the fear among other dealers that that um, Misky generated. Let's see what else. What else has been um, testified to? Ah, there, there's been a lot of testimony about the use of chemicals as weapons, termite chemicals as weapons. Uh, apparently, in the termite process, they use a something called vicane, which is what kills the termites. But it's also very dangerous because it has no smell, no odor, and you can't see it, you can't smell it. And so the federal regulations require that to use vicane, you have to mix it with another thing called chloropicrin, which is like tear gas. So you mix them together, and then anyone who walks into a room by accident, you know, they don't know that this house is being fumigated, and uh, now they can smell it because the tear gas um, causes the reaction and sends them running. Um, it's it's a way it's the way. Um, the law requires chemicals to be safely handled. Well, Miski was apparently doing several things. He was, when you mix the chemicals together, it took longer for the for a house that had been fumigated to air out because you could smell this chloropicrin and it would take six or eight hours to, for the, you know, let people back in. Whereas he found out apparently that if you didn't use the chloropicrin, you just used the really poisonous stuff, you couldn't smell it. So they could open the house earlier and hope that no one no one suffered as a result, but they could turn over jobs faster, um, you know, clearing their people out, save some save a little bit of money here and there. But they also, and now there've been in in the indictment of Miski, he faces four charges from two incidents where chloropicrin, the tear gas-like substance, was released on the dance floor on a busy weekend night of one of, of several of his competitors. And in each case, there's one charge for actually carrying out a chemical weapon attack and a second charge for conspiring to do a chemical weapon attack. And so far, they've um, the, as I say, the indictment charged them of going into two clubs in 2017, the District Nightclub and the Ginza Nightclub. And both those cases, they the chemicals were picked up from uh, Mike Miske's half-brother, John Stansel, at least according to the testimony. Um, they were taken, driven then down from Kailua back into uh, Honolulu. And someone went in with the, um, in those cases, I think they, they put the chemical in a jar and they just went out and casually poured, poured the substance into a waste basket or just onto the floor, clearing the clubs out. Um, they, were, uh, they were probably very fortunate that there wasn't someone in a wheelchair who couldn't get out fast enough or you know, someone else who could have been really uh, seriously injured. In the process, though, they they also added three more clubs that were attacked in a similar way. Turns out that Miski's brother, John Stansel, had um, been the first, I think, the first to pour the same chemical in uh, another nightclub, the Addiction Nightclub, uh, in also on the edge of Waikiki. And then one of Miski's group of insiders who were known as providing muscle for him, um, Alfredo Cabael, he testified that he poured chemicals in two different nightclubs, the, the Pearl Ultra Lounge in Ala Moana Center and the Soho in downtown Honolulu. So at, in total, five different um, clubs were attacked with his chemicals. I was there one day when a police officer who, um, who was there at a traffic stop uh, when they found two of Miski's people, um, Kalana Freitas and Jake Smith, with a backpack that had the, uh, a jar in it. And they went back, you know, they found drugs and they found a weapon. So they took him to the police station. Um, this was in Kailua, I believe, Kaneohe or Kailua. And they were taking apart the backpack to look what was in it and inventory it. 
And this one officer said, well, he, he, they didn't know what this jar was. So he opened it and he started to take a sniff. And suddenly he, he was unable to breathe. He couldn't inhale, he couldn't exhale. He just, you know, he was choking. Um, the other officers there dragged him out. They closed the room off, sealed it. Um, EMS came and he said it took, he took him quite some time before he was able to breathe again. It was, that was an example of what the, um, what the chemical can do. A second witness who was an FBI specialist in this kind of chemical stuff, he testified that chloropicrin can be lethal given the right circumstances and does can have lasting effects um, that may take hours or days or longer to clear up. Well, trouble breathing, burning, burning in your lungs, um, burning in your sinuses. Um, anyway, so that, there's been a lot of testimony there. And since there's four charges related to chemical weapons, and that's a considered a, it is considered a serious felony because that statute is required by international law. There's an international convention on chemical weapons that includes a description of chloropicrin in a category that that's, should be regulated and, and states are, that sign this chemical weapons convention are required to have a statute like we have that makes the use of, a, of even a legal chemical used illegally makes it a, a federal crime um, and a federal crime under international law. Other kinds of things that we've heard about so far, um, just a, a long litany of armed robberies have been testified about, um, robberies of other drug dealers where they've, Miski's guys have taken their drugs, taken their money, and then divvied up the drugs and resold them. Um, several involved heists of, of illegal game rooms um, where, Minsky's people went in armed and took took money and whatever drugs they, they found there. Um, in some some cases, that the victims became then incorporated into the gang. For example, um, Norman Nakao spoke of an accident. Yeah, at least two people have testified about this armed robbery. Uh, they were buying, one of the people they bought drugs from um, that Norman Nakao and his group bought drugs from when they were associated with Miski was a guy, Nick Carignan. And uh, one day, one of the people involved, um, actually a young woman, Ashla Nakao, got the idea we should rip off Nick Carignan because she heard he had like five kilos of, or five, I think it was five pounds of Coke. Coke or meth, maybe it was meth. Anyway, they had five pounds of drugs in this car. She, she arranged to drive him to a drug deal, supposedly. So they were driving and they're driving through Kalihi and uh, a carload of Miski's guys cut him off in the middle of the day, hopped out with weapons. Norman Akau had a fake movie badge, police badge hanging on him. He walked up holding the holding the bat, said, you know, get out of your car, please. And um, they proceeded to to rob Carignan, take his drugs, go back to Waimanalo and split the drugs up for resale. And later Carignan became part of their group. I mean, he was just, you know, went from being victim to being integrated. Um, and that seems to be in many cases what happened. What else? Um that's right. They spent a lot of time talking about things that seem minor compared to, you know, kidnapping and murder or murder for hire. Um, but some of those are important to establish that Miski's organization qualifies as a racketeering organization. And that's important. The racketeering conspiracy is the number one charge in this in this case. And if they can prove that it's a racketeering organization, the rest of the prosecution gets easier. Apparently, with a racketeering conspiracy, um, you're allowed to then use hearsay evidence that would not be allowed in a normal criminal trial 
you're able to use it in a RICO prosecution. That that was put into effect because, you know, um, it, it was put in in order to attack organized crime because everybody knew, look, the guy on the top, he's insulated. He orders stuff to be done, but the only people who do it are these the low lowlifes below him or working their way up the ladder in, in the organization. <clears throat> so, so the law was written in order to allow them to get to the guy on the top. So people, people down below could say, well, he told me, or I heard Joe said he, the boss told him, and that all becomes um, admissible if they can prove a racketeering conspiracy. So they, they touch on a number of small things. Um, payroll, payroll fraud. Um, Miski would pay a bunch of people in cash. I um, mean, sometimes people work for his termite company and they got their regular 40 hours a week paid by the company in the normal process and the other, and any overtime, and each one of them had to work a seven day week, overtime was paid in cash. So they didn't pay payroll taxes. They didn't, the, their guys didn't pay income taxes. They, in, in at least one case, Wayne Miller, um, he was a longtime friend and protege of Miski, got out of prison in the beginning of 2014, pretty quickly went back to work for Miski's organization. But he was working on the on the side of creating drug deals and doing other criminal things. But he needed to show his parole officer that um, or a probation officer that he was, you know, gainfully employed. So they ginned up combine the termite payroll stubs and have introduced some of those in evidence to show that um, it was another, again, seemingly minor fraud, but critical for checking off a list of, of racketeering things that, that had been done. <clears throat> um, Misco, okay, in addition to under trying to um, question the credibility of witnesses, the defense attorneys have consistently used the idea of Misky's organization must have been um, legitimate. It was a real legitimate business. And so someone's testified that, you know, they, they stole money, they paid people in cash, they defrauded people, they didn't use the chemicals they said they were using. And the defense attorney would come up and say, well, here's a picture of Kamakapili Church being treated by Kamana Termite. Did you know that? Did you know that they did Blaisdell Center? Did you know that they did the, you know, this hotel yeah. or that hotel or this apartment building? Did you know that? And so sort of trying to sidestep the question of <clears throat> had they carried out illegal activities by just saying it must have been legit, right? Look at all the big jobs they did. So that's that's one of the tensions that goes on and on and on. Um, they've, they've alleged fraud and making change orders. Um, the government has alleged through the testimony of at least two people involved um, in 2010, I believe it was, Kama and the termite did, treated the, the um, kitchen cabinets in hun several hundred units in a in a large new condominium, Keola Lai condominium. And there was some dispute about this job. Um, Miski's defense puts it up as, look, this is the biggest condo job ever done. And Miski's people, they did, did, did it really well. And there, no, there weren't any complaints. Other testimony said, including from um, Michael Botha, you remember back the guy who, who was threatened by Miski and threatened right back, he was. He said his company was prepared to make a bid, but the, the the construction company coordinating this said they wouldn't accept his bid. And turns out that his bid would have been something around a quarter million dollars. Miski's bid was four and a half million dollars. But um, one of the man, one of the management uh, people in the construction company said he was he was directed. Get 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 Missy's contract. Don't let anybody else bid. So the government didn't directly challenge that, but clearly was implying to the uh, to the jury that there was 
there was some hanky panky involved in, in making that deal. Um, they've talked about licensing fraud, people in the termite company doing jobs they were not qualified to do legally. Um, they, apparently, none of the companies had enough um, a light, enough of licensed people for particular jobs to coordinate the, and actually do the chemicals for the fumigation. Um, so Miskis Mis would just send people out and, you know, just go do it, you know. Um, in some cases, they were caught later. In other cases, they weren't. Um, they presented evidence that when inspectors came, they would get advanced tips and they would, you know, there, there are federal regulations for how you have to store these dangerous chemicals. And of course, they just store, put them in the back room and piled them up and da, da, da. When the inspections came, they would take everything out and put it in a nice place with lots of ventilation so it looked like it was legal. And then as soon as the inspectors left, they'd pile them all back up inside. Um, they had testimony about drug deals, um, especially the biggest one was a 2014 deal when Miski allegedly put up three to four hundred thousand dollars and sent two of his guys, Wayne Miller and uh, Carlos uh, Ortiz, um, flew to California to meet with representatives of a, that, a group that had contacts with the Mexican cartel. Miller had been in prison with one of their people and had worked out this, this connection. They were getting five kilos of cocaine. They turned over the money. They were being driven then to San Francisco airport where a crooked TSA agent was going to get them through security. And um, when they got busted by the DEA and local police, Miski's two people got cut loose soon afterwards. They were, they were detained, but released because their car didn't have either the money or the dope in it. So they were cut loose. Um, but they both testified about their role in that. Um, or excuse me, it was, the 2014 deal was not Ortiz. It was Putinbaugh. Um, uh, Putinbaugh. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Mike Putinbaugh. <clears throat> um, so let's see. Where are we? We've gotten down to the last witness, who I think will still be on the stand next week, is Ashley Wong, who was Johnny Fraser's girlfriend. And she had started setting the stage of, you know, what what she saw from her position um, at the time of his disappearance. And she went she went back through how they met and how they how they were connected with Miski and how Miski initially um, blamed Fraser, insisting that he was the driver of the car that had an accident that ended up killing his Miski's son. Um, but that after Caleb's death, um, Miski suddenly changed course and said he wanted to help them and offered them a place, offered Johnny a car they were going to fix up in, in memory of Caleb and offered, eventually offered them a place to stay in, in a condo in Hawaii Kai where um, um, Caleb's wife, um, Delia, was living, and so they moved in, and that's and they'd been there only a only a couple of weeks at the time that Fraser disappeared. So they're setting the stage. There's a number of witnesses coming up this week. Um, the ones I I have been told about have to do with the building that he was kidnapped from, and what the situation was there, and how it related to Miski. So it's unclear whether we're going to get any real details or whether we're, there, again, we have to wait for the pieces of the puzzle to be put together. Um, they're, so they're, they're moving through. They've, they've talked about, um, had testimony about a murder for hire conspiracy targeting Joe Boy Tavares, uh, Waimanalo man who back, you know, 20 years ago was involved in um, the conflict within the, the Teamsters Union and the guys working 
on transportation for the movie industry. And there was a battle over control between different factions. Um, Joe Boy had you know, been charged in that case, has a, quite a reputation in Waimanalo. And Miski thought, apparently thought that he was cooperating with police uh, or with law enforcement um, and giving information about Miski's operation. So he tried to hire Jake Smith and Lance Bermudez and Taihan Moon and a couple of others to kill Joe Boyd Tavares. And so they've had testimony um, already about that murder for hire conspiracy. Again, he wasn't killed, but it's a conspiracy. It doesn't matter if the crime was actually, I mean, if the intended crime was committed because the crime in this case is the conspiracy itself, the agreement, the plan to do something and the agreement to do it in which someone takes at least one step. And in this case, um, a couple, at least a couple of people took their weapons and hid outside Tavares's house, hoping to ambush him, but he never came out at that time. So uh, nothing happened. And eventually the contract was called off. Um, they've had testimony about the uh, assault and attempted murder of Lindsay Kinney at a movie set in um, uh, Ka'ava. Um, so that again, that's they've kind of checked off the boxes with several different people testifying about that. And I think we're going to hear more on that case. And let's see. It, I'm just finishing writing about and I've written before about the um, the assault at Aloha Tattoo or Kailua Tattoo Parlor, where a couple of guys came in, assaulted the owner. Um, he, you know, trying to protect himself, pulled out a pocket knife and stabbed the guy who was who was kicking and punching him. <clears throat> and at the time. He believed that uh, um, uh, Jake Smith was, was wearing a, a skull mask and was filming while a younger guy was doing the punching as the one who got stabbed. Well, it turns out <clears throat> testimony by Smith <clears throat> and two other people who were are waiting for them while they went in and, and tried this assault. Smith said that Miski hired him to go in and, and put this guy in the hospital, the owner of the shop, because he had, he had embarrassed a friend of Miski's, um, somebody named Billy Whitney, who ran a, a rival tattoo parlor that Miski had allegedly invested in. And so Smith set it up. He knew that he was told that Stancil knew the Aloha tattoo operation. And so Stancil drove them there and Smith and, and the eventual victim, um, Dason Ka'ai, went into the, into the tattoo parlor. Ka'ai seemed to be high. There were witnesses there who have testified that he was you know, pacing around, sweating, nervous, um, and then carried out this assault. And when, it, when they ran out, I had been stabbed. He jumped in the, in the waiting car. Smith jumped in the waiting car. They drove away. The, the owner ran out with his knife, stabbed the two passenger side tires. So the car barely got around the corner, stopped. All the guys who could run ran. They scattered. Kai was left and was found later unresponsive and pronounced dead. Um, you know, didn't didn't make it. But after that, Miski um, allegedly met with the four guys who were left and arranged, gave them money, told them, don't go home. They collected their phones. Tell them, you just you go to their go to these hotels and hide out. They changed hotels the next day and tried to stay away so that they wouldn't be couldn't be found to to uh, interrogate about what happened. Subsequently, um, the owner of the shop, Tim Goodman, Good, Goodrich, um, said he, he had made a mistake. He had first thought it was Jake Smith who was in the skull mask. <clears throat> he now believes 
it was actually Johnny Stansel, Misky's brother. And that seems consistent with the stories told by the other people in the car. <clears throat> so I think those are the biggies that have come up so far. And as I say, though, there's so many little stories in, in almost every witness that comes up has more than one thing to talk about. There's, so there's a there's hundred untold stories that are going to hopefully more pieces of them will come together and in another month we'll be able to do this again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what I I would suspect that they would have Delia come and testify that she was involved in getting them separated so Johnny Frazier could be <clears throat> taken. She, she is on the prospective witness list. Um, there's another person on the list um, who was... <clears throat> Basically, Miski's live-in, long-time live-in girlfriend, Andy Kaneakua. Kaneakua? Um, anyway, and, Andy was like the mother hen. And she she told Delia what to do and what, what she couldn't do. Um, she had previously taken care of, um, of Caleb. And she was like the mother to Caleb, made him do his homework and do all those things. Um, the government has has filed a motion to have several people appear as hostile witnesses, which apparently gives the government more leeway in questioning them, mm -hmm. um, whether or not they're going to be caught. The other two are, are girlfriends of Miski's former, I guess, former girlfriends. Um, and it's not, it's not clear whether they will actually testify or not, but they will all have, you know, key testimony as well. Yeah, because I'm surprised they didn't like maybe charge Delia with like a accomplice or something because she was she was involved in separating the two of them so they could carry out that kidnapping. Well, she was involved in she ran, you know, basically ran much of the office, so she would have been involved in a lot of the the fraudulent deals that were going on, and she was in the middle of the email chain. They have there are two counts of obstruction of justice which alleged that Miski arranged to have um, fake letters of reference produced and submitted to, to the court when they were trying to get him out on bail. And the government uh, eventually, you know, right before trial, the government figured that out and added two charges um, of obstruction. And Delia was, e those, all those emails were going through Delia so as you say, yeah, I'm not sure what what she provided to get such a good deal. Um, I always suspected actually that Misky was was holding out to get Delia a good deal, and that he would then plead. And so I'm, I'm it's hard to see what it's hard to see what he he's going to accomplish by going through trial. You know, the evidence appears so weighty and has, has so many layers and so much backup in the documentation and emails and text messages and WhatsApp messages that it's hard to see him coming out of this scot-free. You know, even even simple things like the chemical weapons charges, each of those charges um, has a maximum sentence of life in prison. You know? both the conspiracy and actually using a, a, a weapon. So, I mean, there are heavy charges floating around that, that uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how he gets out of. Yeah. But I don't know. What could the government possibly offer him at that point? You know what I mean? <clears throat> they can, they could cut it down to um, a serious drug charge and the racketeering conspiracy, and he could get out when he's seventy-five. <laughs> you know, perhaps, but who could he yeah. give them? Uh, maybe yeah. he doesn't have anyone he can give them. Well, that's everyone's. Everyone, there's a guessing game about that. Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah. Although I remember, I told you what Lindsey Kenny had said. So, you know. Yeah about a bruce so yes <laughs> but he's Russ. no he's no longer but, around so right yeah i mean 
Maybe it does end with him as far as anybody who's alive. Maybe it ends with again, Misk is what I, I mean. Again, there's a lot of guessing going on. <laughs> I think that maybe may over the next couple of weeks that somewhat more of that will come out. Although, see, none, none of that is charged in the case. And so if the prosecution tries to introduce information about that, it, it it can be the judge is likely to be asked to to rule it out of order because it's um, unfairly prejudicial to Miski. He's not charged with anything with having people higher than him or following orders or mm -hmm. implicating others. That's one of the problems with this kind of a, a prosecution is the public. We're concerned about did he have crooked cops protecting him? Did he have crooked prosecutors protecting him? Did he have yeah. somebody higher up in the criminal chain who was pulling levers to help him out? Those are the things going forward that make the most difference. And yet, um, those are pretty much off limits in this mm -hmm. case so far. Yeah, that is interesting because that I know that was something that people were concerned about. And yes. it doesn't look like anything has come out or maybe will come out in relation to those topics. Right. And and Again, because the question here is, did he or did he not use weapons? Did he or not? Did he or did he not take part in a drug conspiracy? Did he, or, you know, did he? What was his relation to Jake Smith? What was his relation to these other people? Um, that's one thing worth worth mentioning is, <clears throat> Misky apparently pulled together. He paid them or offered them other inducements, um, power or influence within his organization. But he drew in people who had their own criminal groups, like Norman Akao was part of a group in Kaneohe around a motorcycle club that he was part of, the Nakipi Motorcycle Club. <clears throat> he testified that actually <clears throat> at that time, <clears throat> he had become a member of the USO criminal gang, the United Samoan organization. And he had done that while he was in prison. He, he got involved in an armed robbery when he was like 20, 19 or 20 years old. The, the taxi driver uh, was shot. Um, he was charged, I mean, he was charged and convicted. Um, Norman served 10 years before he got out. And then he said it was about eight years through his prison term that he finally had to join a group to help protect other he and himself and other Hawaii inmates. <clears throat> they formed then he and uh, another man, Zef Salas, formed Nakipi. And it quickly became, he said, yeah, one of these outlaw criminal gangs. They were involved in assaults on behalf of Uso. But they also did other, you know, they also got involved in drug dealing. They got involved in collecting money from drug deals. Um, but the prosecutor said, but when you did these things for Miski, were you at, were you acting for Uso? No. Were you acting for anybody else? No. Were you acting for Nakipi? No. When he did stuff for Miski, it was because he was drawn into Miski's organization. So there's going to be a lot of that, of the defense saying, oh, so-and-so on the North Shore, he was separate. Smith over here, he was separate. Aka over here, he was separate. Nothing to do with Mr. Bisky. But again, this is one of those cases where there's other lines of evidence, the phones and the text messages and surveillance um, that, that's going to undercut that, that argument. Anyway, there's a lot to come. <laughs> Yeah, it's almost like maybe they're using like the avalanche strategy where they just have so much stuff that the defense can't possibly fight it. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, as I say, they're they're checking every box they can. So I, I just hope that you know it's obvious that the the um the jury is overwhelmed. And the the jury is as tired as the lawyers are, mm. and they have months more to go. So Everybody, all the parties are gauging who's favored. You know, is fatigue in our favor or their favor, and how is that? How is that going to play out in the end? And I think those are 
there are several law students who have gotten involved in this uh, trial observation. And uh, those are the questions that they've been told to look for, right? How does all this play out? How, how does the defense work when the when the odds seem so stacked against them yeah. and what what can be learned from from the whole experience and that's that's going to be interesting uh as well who do you so, think we, um who do you think with your knowledge of this who do you think or who are you looking forward to in the future hearing what they have to say oh De it's delia for me but i was wondering what you think lance bermudas oh yeah, yeah. um yeah. Uh, the the four who were in protective custody were Wayne Miller, Jake Smith. No, Jake Smith wasn't. Wayne Miller, um, Lance Bermudez, and Harry Kaohi. Um, so I assume those latter two who have not testified yet, they're gonna be key because there's some reason that they were they were pulled out of the general population and have been hidden by the um feds uh prior to trial um and jason yokoyama who oh, was yeah. you know he's gotten off pretty light in this case but he was in the middle of the nightclub and a number of other things he's been accused of um uh, routinely purchasing weapons to channel to Minsky. um he was uh allegedly gave the order to have Lance Bermudez come and pick up a van that had been used in, in Fraser's kidnapping and take it out to Eva and set it on fire, um, destroy it. Um, so I think he's another one that's going to be very critical because because of the position he was in. And then, as, as I said, Andy and Delia. Yeah. I'm surprised the feds didn't use leverage on maybe like Bermuda to say, look, you're the one who burned the van. If you don't tell us who was involved in this murder, we'll just charge you with it. Well, you know, you know that they, <laughs> I mean, I mean, he, he doesn't get off, he doesn't get off, uh, get out of jail free card in this one. Um, although they all pled, they, they pled to some serious stuff. But I, what I mean is I'm wondering, you would think we would know if some of them knew directly who was involved. And that's what I'm saying. I wonder why the feds just well, didn't say, if you don't tell us who carried this out, we're just going to charge you with it. You had the van. You burned it. Well, we're going to find out. <laughs> oh, you think so? You think that uh, some names well, might be named? Obviously, the feds have a theory. <clears throat> um they may not have direct evidence, but they have they've already put in the circumstantial evidence, people who are being recruited on the um, apparently on behalf of Miski through third parties um, to carry out the the kidnapping and the murder. Um, Wayne Wayne Miller testified that <clears throat> and Akao both testified that the plan was to have um, Fraser kidnapped, and have been, then be driven around to the North Shore where a boat would take him out and do whatever it was going to do. Um, we don't know. The assumption has always has been that that was, it was going to be Miski's boat, the, the painkiller. <laughs> oh, I have to tell, this is a funny one, a, a joke on myself. <clears throat> Early on, as soon as they said, Miski bought this Boston whaler, 37 foot Boston whaler in preparation for using it to um, get rid of Frazier's body. And the, and the boat was named the painkiller. And I said, perfect. What a diabolical name for, you know, this situation. Like, what was he thinking naming this the painkiller and using it in a murder plot? Well, I was there one day when they, <clears throat> apparently the painkiller was not new it was purchase used and this is testimony by the uh, the first owner of the painkiller and i'm so embarrassed um they asked him so um where did uh, well, no actually they didn't ask him i asked him when he finished his testimony i caught him in the hallway and said so where did you get the name painkiller you named it the painkiller why and he says oh 
It's a drink in the Caribbean where you go to one of those resorts and you get this rum drink and they called it the painkiller. <laughs> well, there goes my theory. <laughs> the, my, my best theory of the diabolical nature of the Miski Enterprise goes down in a rum drink from the Caribbean. <laughs> Yeah. I just feel like there's, you know, they could also put pressure on Delia by saying, look, you were involved in getting them separated. If you don't, if you don't know who's involved in, in actually carrying this out, we'll just charge you with it because you were well, involved. They, you know, <laughs> no, unless um, they can't afford to, to make that kind of charge unless right. they know that they can convict that person. Because right. if they, if they have a frivolous charge in here, it's going to get bounced, and and once if one gets bounced, then that increases the odds that defense will be able to uh, leverage that into others. And I mean, you know, in each of these cases, there were intense negotiations over these plea deals. So I think we just have to wait and see um, uh, what comes out in the end. I wouldn't. You, I wouldn't. Pre yeah. You know, unlike these. Uh... For example, the first 48 they film here in Tulsa, near where I live. And uh, you often see, like, the police officers interviewing people on the show, obviously. And a lot of times they'll say, look, you can be a witness to this or you can be a suspect in this murder. So I'm surprised they didn't put some pressure on some people to find out who carried this out. Because so far we have no I, idea. Well, so far we have no idea. That's not the same as they didn't put pressure. You know, yeah, I'm they sure put, they did. They, you you know they did. <laughs> Do you think we'll ever find out through this trial? Do you think those names are going to come out, or no? I I don't know. I don't know. I, stay tuned. That's what I say. Stay tuned. Because you would think that would have came out in the media. Okay, these are these are the people that were involved. Blah 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 blah. But it hasn't. No. So, you're correct it hasn't <laughs> so i've always wondered about that you know because that's the most serious charge obviously but they can get them on so much <laughs> other stuff but that is the most serious one and that's the one a lot of people are curious about who who carried yeah. this out well again <clears throat> because he's charged both with the murder and with the conspiracy to commit the murder uh he's charged with um kidnapping of fraser and the conspiracy to kidnap fraser it leaves the door that if they don't actually know which, who actually did the deed, it doesn't, it doesn't matter because he can be convicted of conspiracy in each case without knowing that. Right. So, you know, it would make us feel better to know, but I don't, I don't know if we're going to know that. The government seems to feel they can prove this without, um, without having a body. Right, and not knowing exactly the circumstances under which that happened. We'll just have to wait and see. Because, I mean, these guys aren't that sophisticated. You would think somebody would have let the lid off of the secret of who, who carried it out. Well, people are still afraid. Yeah. Yeah. And Generous. we don't know. I mean, there's a bunch of people here who are dead. Um, you know, uh, one of the guys who, who pounded on the bartender and uh, when he was taken to Sand Island, Hanson Apo, he was murdered a few years ago, and his um, the jury has been un was unable in two tries to convict the person who shot and killed him. Um, two of the two other people who, or at least, uh, let's see. two people whose names have come up as part of a North Shore group that Miski was able to forge relationships with were killed in a shootout at Hollywood Joe's. Um, there must be, I'm, I'm sure there are others who are no longer on this earth um, who may have had knowledge of what happened. Uh, again, if, it's, if they got three more months of trial to go, we're going to hear a lot more. How convenient. For, from, but I mean, that one at Oliva Joe's really had nothing to do with Miski. You know, was, that was like retaliation. Excuse me, um, the young the young man yeah. who who shot and killed the other two. Well, actually, he was shot himself. Yeah, but he was able to kill the other two. Was an FBI informant 
who took part in several of these robberies with Miski's crew. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, did, they had uh, they had taken action against him. So he was retaliating. Yeah, it's not it's not clear. I mean, uh, we don't know all the circumstances, mm-hmm. but again, um, uh, Dusky had been uh, mentioned before. Uh, Wayne Miller introduced Dusky, Dusky Toledo, one of the victims of that shooting, to uh, Miski and encouraged Missy to hire him to kill Frazier. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of connections and overlap. Uh, one of their close friends and associates, um, Kali Young, um, who's now serving another sentence for drug dealing, uh, took part in, again, another person who took part in a series of these um, uh, assaults and robberies involving the Miski crew. He, he was part of the Miski crew, and he ran uh, on that, his own um, crew of young men, younger men on the North Shore, including Adric, the killer, um, and Dust, Dustin um, Young Toledo, who uh, was was the second victim in that Holly Ridge shooting. So there's a lot of there's a lot of connections that. We don't understand yet, and they have—they've only been testified about tangentially so far, as being in, as being present at some of these events. So again, I think those are ones we're going to hear more about. Aha, uh-huh. interesting. Yeah. yeah. So there's well, a lot of good stuff still left. There's a lot of good stuff to come. Well, I don't know. I don't know about good. A lot of depressing. <laughs> but um, I mean. More but interesting. Like, uh, meaning, meaning, sub- substance. Yeah, <clears throat> sub- substantial. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it's gonna, it's gonna put a lot of work on you. Well, we'll we'll see. We we have our eyes and ears out there. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, you can get some rest. But <laughs> you know, a, a lot of people watch the first one. Obviously, when I put videos out there, and uh, everyone who. Um, when I share links and stuff, I always tell people, I lend, I-L-I-N-D dot net. This, this is really where you want to go. A lot of the stuff, it's all coming from him, stuff that I've covered. And, you know, I knew about Ian Lind when I went to Copy and Lane Community College in like <laughs> 2010. So, you know, uh, Mike Sy was the first person ever mentioned his name to me. Huh. So I knew who he was back then. It's kind of crazy that now we're, doing some of these yeah. videos you know? <laughs> but i it was he had always said you know this guy can do what he wants to do he can go deeper into stuff because he just does it you know yeah well thank you for um, promoting it you know sharing it we got the more people who know what's going on the, i still get tips now and then from from people who want to make a connection that i haven't seen yet yeah yeah there's there's a lot of those people out there but uh yeah i encourage people go to his site you know and he's always got new stuff up it seems like every couple of days and really in-depth um writing and reporting that you won't get from the news so all right well listen hey thank you todd yes i appreciate it and as always appreciate taking time to do this and for everyone who uh, enjoyed this episode appreciate it until next time take care